Hi everyone. I would like to begin by acknowledging the Yuan people who are the traditional owners of the land from which I am coming to you today in the south coast of New South Wales and extend that respect to elders past, present and emerging from across all of the lands which we're meeting on today. Welcome and thank you for joining us for this final question and answer session for National Science Week 2021. The year, uh, the theme for this year in National Science Week is food different by design. And today's event will be looking at the strange and wonderful fish and sea life that live in Antarctica and how we do fishing in Antarctica for species like the Patagonian toothfish. Hopefully you've been able to look at the worksheet for this session and started thinking about some of the questions that you have for our special guests. Today we'll be receiving your questions via Mentimeter. So please send your questions to the speakers at menti.com, typing in the code 54103205. Today we are joined by Rhys Arangio, who is over in Western Australia. He is the Senior Manager of Environment and Policy at Austral Fisheries, and he can answer all of your questions about fish that we find in the cold deep seas of Antarctica, like the Patagonian toothfish. We'll put up a picture of a toothfish here for you to have a look. Hi, Rhys. Hi, Alexis. Hi, everybody. Nice to be here today, and I hope you all enjoy the session. Thanks, Rhys. We're also joined by David Agnew, who is calling in from Tasmania. David is the Executive Secretary of the Commission for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources. David can answer your questions about how we can fish sustainably and protect marine ecosystems in Antarctica when we're carrying out activities like fishing. Hi, David. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the session. Now I will hand you over to our host. She is a science communicator with a background in marine biology, a presenter and a model, Laura Wells. Hi, Laura. Hi, thanks, Alexis. And hi, everyone. I hope you are ready to answer and ask some great Antarctic questions because we have two people here that can answer everything for you. Now, Antarctica doesn't have any native human population or government, so no one really lives there. And visiting Antarctica isn't very easy or affordable for tourists who want to travel there by boat. But scientists and adventurers and research groups all travel there by plane and by boat. So Reese, I want to ask you, what is it like traveling by boat to Antarctica? Thanks, Laura. Well, I haven't been to Antarctica myself, but I have been to the sub-Antarctic where we fish around Heard Island. Uh, it's an Australian island about four and a half thousand kilometres southwest of Perth. I went down there on a boat a little bit like the one you can see behind me, um, one of our fishing vessels. Um, took us about 10 days to get there. Uh, leaving from Perth, uh, the weather is quite nice, as you all know, but as you go further south, uh, it gets increasingly cold, increasingly windy. The waves get increasingly larger. Um, and yeah, we, we fish in all kinds of weather down there from snow, hail, sleet, uh, 90 kilometre an hour winds, um, 10 metre swells. So it's pretty hectic down there. Yeah, it sounds like a really rugged part of the world, that Southern Ocean. Lots of different variables, lots of big waves. I travelled to Antarctica on a boat from South America, so not from Australia. And Antarctica is really close to South America. It's only a few days on a boat, but I can't imagine being on a boat for 10 days just to get down to those sub-Antarctic islands. That's crazy. I am just going to go over to a student poll and I want everyone listening in to answer the question. Where do polar bears live? Do they live in the Arctic, the North Pole, or Antarctica, the South Pole? What do you think? You can answer at menti.com with the code 54103205. So do polar bears live in the, the North Pole or the South Pole? David, I'm going to throw to you. What's the answer for this one? They don't live in the South Pole. They don't, do Sorry, they? Guys. They're only in the <laughs> They're only in the Arctic, everyone. Polar bears are only in the Arctic. We don't find them in Antarctica. Uh, Reese, I want to go um, back to you. When you have been traveling by boat down to the sub-Antarctic islands to go fishing, have you seen many other animals in the ocean down there on your way? Yeah, we do. We um we do see different types of seabirds, uh, the albatross and petrel, 
uh, which are very abundant down there, but some of them are under some extreme pressure from previous illegal fishing uh, 20 odd years ago. We've also been lucky enough to see sperm whales and killer whales as well. Excellent. So lots of activity in the water down there and in the sky, which is really cool. Uh, David, I am going to throw over to you. You work for an organisation that looks after all of the living resources essentially in Antarctica. Now, no one actually technically lives in Antarctica, but what sort of living resources are actually down there? Well, thank you, Laura. It's, it's huge. Um, so you've got a map behind me, you can see. <clears throat> the, the whole ocean around Antarctica is around about 10% of the global ocean, which is, which is enormous. And you can imagine there are different habitats. So to the north, um, where Reese was talking about where he goes, he's going fishing, it's slightly warmer than in the real south. So in the real south, it's covered with sea ice a lot of the time, certainly in the winter, it melts in the summer. So you've got the sea ice coming backwards and forwards. And that's where you find emperor penguins living on the continent itself. They, you, I'm sure you've seen them nesting there. They're very cute little babies that they, they grow up and they sit on, their, <clears throat> they sit on their, their father's and mother's feet while they, while they grow up, fantastic. And then in the sea, you've got seals, you've got birds, you've got squid, you've got some little shrimp-like thing called krill, which I'm sure we'll talk about later. And um, whales, of course, um, all eating the, 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 the little animals that live in the water and making a, taking advantage of the very lots of the lots of sunlight you get in the summer and lots of nutrients that grow lots of, of wonderful things for them all to eat but there are lots and lots of different habitats there because it's such a big place so there's no one it's just not all exactly the same it's quite variable exactly and Antarctica is actually known as a desert. It is one of the driest places on earth because it doesn't really receive too much rainfall down there. So David, what do you think the best time is to actually visit Antarctica? In the summer is way the best because that's when all the birds come to breed. Um, and because they are birds, they need to lay eggs. They can't do it in the water. So they have to come to land. And that's where you can find them all um, on the islands bringing their chicks up and they're swimming off the islands as well, going and catching food for themselves and for their chicks. And the seals are doing the same. They bring out, they, they um, have their babies on land. So summer is the best time for that, but they're all there in the winter as well. And so we need to make sure that in the winter, there's also enough food for them so they can get through the winter and they don't die because there isn't enough food. And that's why we work very hard to make sure that the impact that humans have on the Antarctic is really low. Exactly. Uh, Reese. what is life like on a boat traveling down to the sub-Antarctic islands? What can you expect every single day? Uh, you can expect a lot of fishing. So, so our vessels stay at sea for typically between 80 and 100 days at a time. Uh, these, are, these are large fishing vessels that typically house uh, about 30 crew, as well as two government approved observers to oversee what we're doing down there to make sure we're doing the right thing. Um, the, the vessels uh, fish within two swings on board, so it's a 24-7 fishing vessel. Uh, the crew will work for 12 hours each before they head off for their off swing. Uh, while they're off, they can sit down and relax. There's a, a, a theatreette with a, a big TV and they can watch movies and TV shows. Um, they can catch up on a book. Um, some of the guys like to bring a, a guitar as well. To, so plenty of time to, to catch up on um, some relaxation, but at the same time, uh, really hard job, um, really tough conditions as well. Absolutely a tough one. I am going to throw our second thought starter out to David. Um, fishers in Antarctica must be very careful not to take too many fish because other marine animals like whales and leopard seals and penguins, they rely on fish and krill for their diets too. So there's a, we need to have a balance between humans and other animals. David, what are some of the ways that we can make sure that there are enough fish in the ocean in Antarctica for us and all of the other marine life? It's a really great question, Laura. Thank you. When, when, we, when we do um, this sort of thing any, everywhere, we try and make sure that we don't take that much fish. Um, we take enough fish so that the uh, fish can reproduce and the, uh, every year and the populations can be maintained. 
and that there is some left for ecosystems. And we do this across the world. This is good fisheries management. But we take an extreme view in Antarctica. So let us say that the normal level at which we fish something down goes from here down to here. In Antarctica, we say that, no, we're going to make sure that there's that much of it left. So we make sure that there's more than enough of the original population left for all the predators. So for instance, in rhesus fishery, it's, it's not fished really hard, it's fished lightly in a sustainable way. So there's plenty of food there for all the ecosystem to maintain that, but it's also making it possible to have a fishery um, so that humans can eat the fish as well. Unreal. So Reese, you, you and your company, you actually fish for fish down in Antarctica and the sub-Antarctic islands. What is one of the species that you try and catch? So our target species uh, in the Head Island fishery, we have two. Um, the, the main one is the one sitting behind me. That's the Patagonian toothfish. Um, it can grow up to uh, almost two meters long, over 100 kilos. But the size that we like to catch wow. is similar to that behind me. So about a meter long, uh, about 15 kilos or so. Um, it ends up on the plates of some really nice restaurants around the world. Um, and you can also find that here in Australia as well. And what other species besides humans eat the Patagonian toothfish or the Antarctic toothfish? Well, quite interesting. Um, so while the toothfish is a predator down there at the bottom of the ocean, um, they also have, uh, they are also prey items as well. So we do know that the sperm whales uh, do target the toothfish uh, and we see that ourselves um, with some interactions between toothfish and sperm whales. And also some of the toothfish that come up on the hooks you can see lacerations and scars on them from um, some previous histories with uh, colossal squid, for example, and also wow. some of the fur seals down there as well. Wow, so huge colossal squid are trying to eat those toothfish down there. That's incredible. Yeah, um, indeed. Also, There's some really great footage of um, so the size of some of those squid down there are the size of your kitchen table. So some pretty amazing stuff. Wow. Also, Reese, I wanted to ask you, what methods do you use for fishing in Antarctica? How are you actually catching these fish? We use demersal long lines. So uh, we've got an automatic baiting machine that baits the hooks uh, for us. It cuts the squid, which we use for bait. And then we set our long lines uh, along the seafloor. So our lines are weighted with an integrated weight. Um, we have to make that sink at a certain rate so that we don't catch seabirds, so that the line sinks below the surface in time that the birds don't get to, to dive on the hooks and, and drown. Um, and we're fishing at the bottom of the ocean down to two and a half kilometres. Wow, that's really deep. And it's great that you're protecting the seabirds as well. Uh, I wanted to ask you one more question. We've had this question from a lot of people that have been writing in. The toothfish, how are they able to survive in such cold water in Antarctica? So the Patagonian toothfish that we catch, uh, as I mentioned at the bottom of the ocean, it's typically around one to three degrees um, at that depth. However, uh, their cousin, the Antarctic toothfish that lives around the Antarctic continent, so a little bit further south than where we are, uh, over millions of years, they've developed uh, an antifreeze in their body that uh, allows them to survive in the literally freezing conditions in the Antarctic. Wow. So... These fish are kind of like X-Men. They've got this antifreeze protein that they, they've evolved in their body to make sure that their blood doesn't freeze because if their blood freezes, it causes crystals and it will kill them in their blood. So they are able to survive in such cold waters down there. They are an amazing species and that's pretty cool. I wonder if, David, do you know if any other animals in Antarctica have an antifreeze in their body? Yes, it's a great question again. And as Reese has explained, um, the, the antifreeze reduces the, the, the temperature that they can live at. And that actually is the case with quite a lot of the fish down there. Um, uh, so uh, the toothfish is part of a group of fish that have evolved over millions of years to live in, in, in Antarctica, and they've developed this antifreeze. So a, a lot of them do have this feature, um, but it's not really, it's not shared with fish uh, outside of the Antarctic, it's something that's specifically evolved there for the fish that live there. Excellent. And David, I wanted to ask you, is there, we've had this question from a few different people, um, 
is there a relationship between overfishing and climate change affecting Antarctica and its resources? Not at the moment, <laughs> certainly. <laughs> well, no, let, let me qualify that. Firstly, we know things are changing um, with climate change. Um, uh, we know that the ice is changing. The, there's more open areas in the summer, rather like the Arctic. Um, we know that there's some shifts in the distribution of some of the animals, including some evidence for shifts in the distribution of the krill, which we will talk about this little shrimp thing. Um, at the moment, there's not really very much evidence for what's anything, anything that's happening to toothfish as a result of this. Um, the second part of your question is that, does this lead to overfishing? And um, as I said, to start off with, we're fishing these animals very lightly. So there is no overfishing at the moment. And as climate change changes distributions and the amount of fish that's down there, Camelard's job is to make sure that that's the Camelard, that's the organization I work for, is, is its job to make sure that it knows how much fish is there so that if there's a reduction in the amount of fish, there can also be a reduction in the amount of fishing. So they stay in balance. That's great. So Camla is looking to protect all of the animals, like the fish and everything that is fished down in, um, in Antarctica with real science. So knowing how many fish are there and knowing how many we can actually take out of the water so that we have fish for the future. Is that right? That's absolutely right. Excellent. Um, I have a question here, David. Antarctica kind of doesn't really belong to anyone. No, not one country owns Antarctica. So why can no people actually really live in Antarctica besides the scientists? Uh, that is a, 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 just to explain where Antarctica came from, it, it, it's always been an icy continent. It was only really discovered around about 100, 130 years ago. So it's not really been, no one's really known about Antarctica for an awful long time and no one has living there um, but the time when it was discovered. So after the discovery, a number of countries started to say, well, I discovered this bit of Antarctica and I discovered that bit. But in the 1950s, they all sat down and they decided that they would set aside Antarctica as a whole for science and peace. And this is what's called the Antarctic Treaty. So all the parties, decided that they weren't going to do any claims. They weren't going to um, go and uh, put um, map, um, areas of the map saying, this is my bit, this is your bit. They were all going to do it. And that's why you have research across the whole continent and research in the ocean around side it, that is multi-member. It's so many different countries participate and nobody actually says, this is my bit or this is your bit but there are research stations on Antarctica that are run by national research programs. So Australia has got three research stations. Um, uh, uh, a lot of other research stations are in this bit up where, let me get that right, there we go, this bit up here. A um, lot of research stations there because they're easy to get to. It's a very interesting part of Antarctica. Um, there are no permanent settlements of non-researchers, um, but there are some temporary um, uh, places where tourists go and camp. And this is an area of developing interest for um, tourism. And uh, we're seeing the Antarctic Treaty parties, this um, uh, group of countries that have come together to help to manage Antarctica for science and peace, starting to look at how they can manage that tourism interest, but still make it very sustainable and with low impact on the Antarctic itself. Great. So no one's living in Antarctica. Lots of people kind of own it. And it was only uh, discovered about 130 years ago. That sounds crazy. It's, very, it's a very young continent in a way. Um, <laughs> Reese, can I throw over to you? What is the most common fish that you can catch in Antarctica? I've been asked this question by a few of the people. <laughs> well, for us, it's, it's the toothfish. Um, we, we monitor all of our catches very closely. We've got two government approved observers on board overseeing our catch as well. And uh, quite luckily, uh, over 90% of the fish that come over uh, onto the boat are toothfish, which is great for the ecosystem because uh, we know that we're not uh, catching too much bycatch. Excellent. And why the Patagonian toothfish is you know, so highly prized. People love it. Why do they love it so much? Is it because it tastes delicious? 
spot on. So the, the toothfish has got a beautiful white flesh, which uh, people like to see on the plate. Uh, because, of its, uh, because of the oils in its body that it uses to control its buoyancy, uh, the toothfish doesn't actually have a swim bladder like most fish. Um, those oils create a, a really uh, fine buttery melt in your mouth texture to the fish, really hard to overcook. So chefs love it. Uh, and it presents really beautifully on the plate and it can be cooked a variety of ways. Excellent. So delicious fish. No wonder it's caught so much and everyone loves it. Uh, David, I've got so many questions here from, it, for, from all the kids. It's so great. Uh, I'm trying to get through them all. They want to know, is fishing getting harder in Antarctica due to ice melting? Is it making the fish move to different areas? Uh, what's happening down there with the ice melt? Um, it's not making it harder, if anything, it's making it easier because there's more access to water. Um, but what's uh, interesting is that the, um, uh, the, the cl climate change is not happening the same over the whole continent. So there are some areas where there's more ice um, now than there was, and there's some areas where there isn't any, there's less ice. You might have seen the fantastic pictures of, of big glaciers carving um, huge icebergs, and they're all coming from this little region here, which is a big ice shelf. And there's another big melt area, which is down here, if I can get that right down there. And this is the one, this is called Pine Island. And this is the, the um, um, big glaciers in here that people are worried about that when they all melt, they're going to suddenly go. But what we've done is each time you've got a melting piece of glacier that exposes a new bit of ocean, um, we, make sure that that's preserved for a, a few years, just so science can get in there and have a look at it. And it's off, it's off limits for any fishing um, uh, until the scientists have had a, had a good look and we know enough about it. So that's the sort of level of management that you need to do as you see this climate change happening. Excellent. And I've got a question here. Is climate change affecting a lot of the animals in uh, Antarctica? Yeah, we think it's affecting the penguins, um, although in ways that people don't quite understand. So there are two different sorts of penguins. Um, uh, the, well, there are lots of different sorts of penguins, but mm -hmm. there are those penguins that like ice. They're a daily penguins, the little black and white ones that are really cute. And then uh, I mentioned the emperor penguins that live on the continent itself. They like ice. And then there are those penguins like chinstraps and gentoo penguins, which um, generally live a bit further north, sort of way up here. So those are penguins that like it being a bit warmer are moving south. And those penguins that like the ice are having a bit of a hard time finding enough ice and areas where they can feel comfortable to breed. So the whole ecosystem is kind of moving south um, and uh, different populations are responding in different ways. We don't think um, that they are responding in any way to major changes that have happened in fishing because we're monitoring that very closely. We think most of the changes are, are responses to climate change and it does concern us, um, but we are monitoring what can happen and reacting as a management body. We can ma act, although we don't manage the penguins as a whole because we don't, we don't have any fishery on penguins. We don't manage penguins, we just monitor them. Okay, so we need to look out for all of our animal species, not just the fish, but all the ones that love the ice as well because of climate change. Um, what is the best thing people can do from home in Australia to make sure that we protect Antarctica and all of its resources for the future? At home, um, the MSC standard puts fisheries up to the test um, to see if they, they are fishing sustainably. And so uh, as David mentioned earlier, many of the toothfish fisheries around Antarctica and the sub-Antarctic are certified as sustainable and well-managed by the MSC. So you can look for that logo um, at a restaurant, at your retailer, um, and not just toothfish, but, but any fish that carries that logo. Absolutely. That's the best way. So if you are buying fish at the supermarket or at a fishmonger, look for that tick that Reese held up before, the MSE tick, and you'll know that those species are the most sustainable fish to buy. And that way you can be looking after Antarctica and all of our oceans as well. Uh, 
I think we'll go to one more question and I want to talk about krill because krill are super cool. They are small kind of prawn like looking animals. They can be up to about six centimeters long and they're all, all through the water in Antarctica and they're the bottom of the food source. So, so many animals eat krill, whales, seals, penguins. David, how can we protect our krill species, these small tiny prawn species in Antarctica? So it, I, I want to say something. Antarctica is really unique in lots and lots of ways. But if you look at that map behind me, it's unique in a way that no other ocean is. And that is that it is circular. So you can go all the way around Antarctica and you do. Krill go all the way around Antarctica. They live, it's exactly the same type of krill that swims all the way around. It doesn't swim all the way around the whole time, but it lives all there. And toothfish does the same. So the, the, the important thing is it's not, you just protect one area over here and this area you forget about. No, we've got to protect the whole lot because they're all interconnected. Most of the fishing for krill takes place in this area here and it's very concentrated. All, as Reese has mentioned that the, um, his toothfish vessels, they have scientific observers on board. The same is true with the krill vessels. They all have scientific observers on board. They're monitored all the time. We take the data from that to understand what the um, status of that, those catches are and the krill. We also have monitoring stations all over this area here where the krill fishery is happening. And they're monitoring the penguins and the seals to see what their reaction is, see that they can get enough food in the summer. And there's a real concern that if you let the fishery concentrate too close to a penguin colony, it will take all the food away. So that's really heavily monitored. And that's the best thing that we can do as an organization. That's what we are doing as an organization. We have learned so much about Antarctica today. We know that there's scientists working down there to protect and look after not only our fish species, but our penguins and our whales and our seals. And we know that the fishermen are doing a really good job to make sure that fishing is sustainable, that there'll be fish for the future, we're only taking out what we need, and that other animals will be protected too, that they won't get caught in nets or in lines. So we're looking out for our seabirds and our whales and our seals and our penguins. And I just wanted to answer one more question that a couple of people have written in, how cold does it get in Antarctica? Well, so on average in Antarctica, it can get down to about minus 50 down in the middle of the continent. So it's really cold. If you stick your head in your freezer at home, it's probably only about minus 15. So it's really, really cold in Antarctica and you have to wear lots and lots of clothes to stay warm. Thank you everyone for listening. Thank you. I'm just going to have a quick shout out to Whitney and Ebony and all of their friends that have tuned in today. Thanks for listening, everyone. And thank you to David and Reese as well. Thank Thanks you, everybody. everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you to all of our guest speakers today, David, Reese, and our wonderful host, Laura, who has joined us all week. And of course, thank you to everyone who joined us and sent in your amazing science questions. We were overwhelmed with all of your wonderful ideas. This series has been hosted by the Marine Stewardship Council's education program, Saltwater Schools. And if you would like to find free resources and lesson plans or learn about um, some of the science questions that you didn't get answered today by an expert, get in touch with us via our website. It's www.msc.org slash saltwater schools. Thanks again uh, for joining us during National Science Week and we look forward to seeing you next time. Bye.